So the first thing that we do when we're working with a kid with selective mutism is we build rapport with them. Because if a kid likes you, they will do whatever you ask them to to the best of their ability. If they don't like you, they will not do anything for you. They couldn't care less what you think. So it's important to build rapport with these kids. If you already have rapport with the kid that you're working with, you don't have to worry so much about this. Although this is great. These, these um, skills are great to use with any kids. But if you've already built rapport, you don't have to worry about rapport building sessions. If you're getting ready to work with a kid with selective mutism, this is a great strategy to use. So in rapport building sessions, we use something from parent-child interaction therapy. Have any of you ever heard of PCIT before? Okay. It's a really good intervention to use with kids with defiant disorders or oppositional behaviors. It teaches parents how to be effective reinforcers and disciplinarians for their kids. But we stole part of that to use with kids with selective mutism, and it's the child-directed interaction part. And during that, parents or adults use something called pride skills. So this is a child-directed interaction, meaning that the kid gets to kind of decide what they want to do, and you're following their lead. And while you're following their lead, you're doing five main things. You're praising them, so you're giving them labeled praise for what they're doing. What's the difference between labeled and unlabeled praise? You're telling them what you like that they're doing. I really like how you built a drawbridge on your castle. I love the colors that you're using. Instead of, wow, great, fabulous. Reflection is probably the hardest of all of these do's. Reflection is reflecting back what they're communicating to you. Now, if they're talking to you, this is easy. Because if they say, I'm going to draw a drawbridge on my castle, you go, oh, you're going to draw a drawbridge on your castle. That's a great idea. Or if they say, I'm going to make my son yellow, you say, you're going to make your son yellow. I love that. If they're not talking to you, this is harder. But you reflect back what they're communicating. So if they point to something, you would say, oh, you're pointing to... The star in your sky, thanks for showing it to me. Or if they nod, oh, you're saying yes, yes, you are pointing to that star. Thanks for letting me know. You're, ref you're reflecting back what they're communicating, even if it's a nonverbal type of communication. Or if they write something, if they say, I don't know, I love dogs, you would say, oh, you love dogs. Thanks for telling me. Imitation just simply means that you're doing what they're doing. So instead of standing over them like most adults do and watching them as they play, you're playing with them. If they're drawing, you're drawing. If they're building with Legos, you're building with Legos. If they're doing a craft project, you're doing the craft project. The D, behavioral description, is sort of like a play-by-play -play sports announcer. So you're basically, you're providing the commentary of what's going on. So you might be saying something like, oh, now you're drawing a moat around your castle. I love that. I wonder if there's going to be fish in your moat. Oh, there's some fish. I see them. Nice job drawing those fish. You're basically just giving kind of a play-by-play -play of what they're doing. You do not have to have an unbroken commentary all the way through. It is okay to have silence in this time. But you're just kind of peppering it. Oh, you're drawing a sun in your sky now. I love your sun. Such a pretty sun. I like how you drew it orange. And then excitement or enjoyment. Um, if a child is younger, you do more of this. You play it up more. Young kids love this. <laughs> love this. We'll want you to do it every minute of every day if you could. The older the kid, the more you downplay this. Because if you do all of this in this, <gasps> the older kids are going to think you're weird. And you will. You'll look really weird. So downplay it if they're older. Play it up if they're younger. The things that you don't want to do. You don't want to ask questions during this time. Why do you not ask questions during this time? Puts them on the spot. It makes them uncomfortable. Creates anxiety. When really what you're trying to do in this portion is build rapport and reduce anxiety. Will they answer you? Probably not. What have you just done? Reinforce the avoidance by setting up failure. Yep. So don't ask questions during this time. Don't give commands simply because we want this to be a child-directed interaction, not an adult-directed interaction. So don't be telling them what to do. 
This is not a teaching moment. If they draw the dinosaur green, please don't tell them the dinosaurs weren't green. <laughs> dinosaurs were actually brown. So let's, let's redraw your dinosaurs brown. It's not, not the moment for that. So you're interacting with kids. The, the more open-ended the play or creative the play, the easier this is. So for example, doing things like drawing arts and crafts, um, Legos, building blocks, anything that's creative is easy to do this. The more structured you get, the harder it is to do this. Like if you're doing this with a, a board game, you can do it. It's just harder because then you're saying things like, you got a five. Good job moving five spaces. I love your five. I mean, it just seems really kind of awkward. Um, you can do it. It just seems a little bit different. So the more open-ended, the more creative the play, the better. And even with older kids, lots of times you can do kind of arts and craftsy sort of stuff with kids, even if they're older, you can do that.